Um, so we're here at the path three, uh, current guidance on scope three emissions, supply chain and beyond. Uh, my name is Robert Parkhurst and we've got with us today, John McDougall, Karen Boyd and uh, Eric Stanek. Um, and um, so we've got a, a series of questions we'll, we'll go through. We have no slides. So sorry if those of you wanted slides, uh, you can go to another session, but this is, <laughs> we're all talk. Um, hopefully some action. Um, so um, I'm gonna start off and ask everybody to provide a, a brief introduction uh, of, of who they are, uh, what they're working on with respect to scope three, uh, 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 scope three reductions and insetting. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself uh, uh, and then give it to each of them. So uh, as I said, I'm Robert Parkhurst. I have a consulting company called Sierra View Solutions and I work at the intersection of agriculture, environmental markets and policy. Uh, I've spent a fair amount of time looking at insets and offsets and it's an exciting and evolving area. Uh, and hopefully we'll have a real lively discussion today about the differences between the two, the challenges and the opportunities. So with that, let me turn it to, to John. And John, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you're working on scope three and or in setting? Sure, yeah, thanks Rob. Um, so uh, John McDougall with, uh, uh, with the new, I'm on our, our portfolio management team. I'm our portfolio manager for our voluntary offset portfolio specifically. Um, I've been working in the business for about 14 years now, um, doing everything from development to asset management to marketing and sale of offsets. Um, with respect to you know, the world that we live in today and carbon, um, scope three insetting is something that we do look at. Um, specifically, our, um, our region ag group uh, is looking at uh, how we're working in scope three with you know, different um, ag-based buyers uh, may have that has connections to their value or supply chain. Um, and we look to kind of connect the dots there through that process and using platforms that can be what we consider off registry and or on registry with some of the platforms like gold standards that are looking at insetting pathways uh, and other standards as well. Beyond that too, we also um, are a large landowner of forests. We're actually the 10th largest, about, I think that now the 10th largest private landowner in the US, uh, which we own forest lands and we acquired um, uh, under our Aurora platform, 1.8 million acres in North America last year, or the year before last in 2022, and converted those timberlands to carbon and carbon projects. And part of that, uh, we're looking at uh, allowing buyers or uh, groups that want to um, acquire lease lands to include in their footprint uh, these lands where they can claim direct reductions within their scope of emissions. Um, and some of those may be associated with our scope three. So I'll stop there. Thanks, John. Karen? Yeah, Karen Boyd with Land O'Lakes in True Terra. And so Land O'Lakes, normally you guys think of butter probably. So there is a dairy subsidiary that is Land O'Lakes, one of the four fully owned subsidiaries of Land O'Lakes. True Terra is another one of the four. And then Winfield United is the third, which is your crop inputs and agronomical insights. They touch about 50% of the planted acres in the United States today. And then there is the Purina animal feed side, which is pretty much everything that's not in your house. So think of cows, chickens, pigs, zoo animals. All of that side of Purina is all under the Land O'Lakes umbrella. And so when we think of scope three assets and emissions factor accounting really, of what those commodities look like today from an emissions standpoint, including those removals for soil carbon. That's how we are actually helping our customers account for those emissions in their supply sheds. And so we work with our downstream partners who are trying to understand what their supply sheds look like. And we implement programs as well as um, understand what those actual values are from a carbon modeling quantification side. We do have a good number of offsets as well. That's where a lot of True Terra has been built from. A lot of those assets has been set, sold to Microsoft and otherwise, but most of where we focus today is actually on that scope three asset piece. Yeah. Excellent. Now, Eric. Yeah. Hello, all. Uh, my name is Eric Stanek. I'm a senior sustainability specialist at Blue Diamond Growers. Um, for those who don't know, Blue Diamond Growers is actually a 100% grower owned cooperative. We're based right here out of California, about 97 minutes away. Um, <laughs> no, it's about, it's about an hour and a half okay. away in the Central Valley. We produce uh, California almonds only, 
and we were started in 1910. Um, and in regards to scope three emissions, um, just so we can kind of think about it here, we consider our grower base as part of our um, scope three um, because we don't actually own our orchards and we don't own our growers. They own us as a sales and marketing cooperative. So we have to think about and interact with them as if they are um, upstream to us. And so um, what we have in terms of scope three projects is we have two main sustainability programs. Our first is referred to as the Orchard Stewardship Incentive Program, which I'll refer to as OSIP. And that program provides growers an incentive payment for completing the California Almond Stewardship Platform, um, as well as Bee Friendly Farming Certification and completing a carbon footprint assessment right now using Cool Farm Tool. We also have a $45 million USDA Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities grant. Um, I will refer to that as the Climate Smart grant. And through that grant, it allows our growers to receive no cost seed or plant material to implement cover crops, conservation cover, um, hedgerows, as well as whole orchard recycling. And we additionally provide a payment incentive on top of that free seed or plant material. So we're trying to reduce the financial barriers to actually implementing climate smart practices in that program as well, we are working to develop an MRV platform to actually quantify what are those environmental benefits or impacts that we're generating, and then creating a traceability system through our supply chain to actually generate value with our downstream partners. So working with customers to actually see, you know, what are your needs and how do we, you know, take that value and provide that back to our growers. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we've talked a little bit about scope three and in setting, and we're here um, at the Navigating the American Carbon World Conference, which has, its core has been um, offsetting, um, at least since about 2007. Um, so what's, but what's the difference between a, a scope three reduction, an inset, and an offset? So whoever would like to take a first stab at that. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll put my view on it. Um, just simply, you know, an offset, the way I like to think about it, is a fungible product once it's registered and issued, meaning you're essentially detaching it from uh, potentially a scope of emissions of the offset project developer, um, in some cases, uh, and being able to fungibly move it to a buyer's uh, you know, scope of emissions so they can use it as a mitigation measure. A inset is uh, looking at reductions within, you know, a, a, a buyer's scope of emissions or a, a uh, you know, uh, an organization's scope of emissions and looking at ways to, you know, whether you remove or reduce those emissions, whether it's scope three, scope two, or scope one. Um, <clears throat> and then I would say, uh, what was the third one? Third one was scope three. Scope three reductions. Scope three reductions, I would say, is, you know, again, mostly focused on supply chain and value chain uh, emissions associated with an organization and how you are tracing those emissions and looking at ways to reduce those emissions. So I would say an inset can be a scope three reduction. Um, a scope three reduction is not necessarily an inset, if that makes sense. So. Excellent. Anyone else want to add uh, other colors to it, other flavors? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's very fair. Um, the way that that we tend to think of it is that whatever's in your supply chain, how you're accounting for those emissions is a scope three thing, generally. And so that could mean an inset, it could mean a scope three reduction, it could mean a carbon intensity score when we're starting to think about feedstock for fuels. All of those different pieces are really just how exactly are you counting for the emissions associated to the thing, whatever the thing is. Yeah, no, it's it's within the same realm for us. And so when I think about <clears throat> what is the difference between a scope three reduction and an inset or an offset, it really is, you know, is it inside or outside of your supply chain? So inset versus offset. And then between scope three reductions and inset, I like what John said, it's kind of the, is it a square or rectangle mm -hmm. type conversation? Um, you know, it's the, the, is it a verifiable outcome and what is the level of rigor that was put behind that measurement, that scope three reduction measurement? And then are you potentially selling or attributing those claims to a specific buyer within your supply chain or how are you handling those claims is really how we you know, discern between scope three reductions and insets, but there's definitely a lot of gray area, especially as you go to look at the different resources online and the research, uh, it's not completely clear what are the differences there. So that's, that's a, a great segue. So what are some of the standards that are out there? So we, we, we've heard about a, a, a bunch of them. Which are the ones 
that, um, uh, well, yeah, what are some of the standards out there? Can you guys tell me kind of who's doing the work in this, who's creating the, the rules and, and the, um, the platforms uh, for, for these programs? You want to go first? All right, Karen, why don't you go first? Yeah. If you guys are going to fight about it, I'm going to pick on you. There you go. Uh, so for awareness, a lot of my background is in renewable fuels and chemicals, so this is a bad Karen question. Fun fact. <laughs> um, but how they're actually going to account for this on the feedstock side for fuels is a very contentious question right now of what that GREET guidance will look like, and we don't know what it is right now. Theoretically, we're going to get that March 1st. It's now March 20th, and we still don't know. So. When we find out, I would be happy to answer this question. But right now, I have no idea. The gold standard has been leading away for insets for a while on their platform. So there is a registration process through the gold standard. Um, Vera, CAR, and ACR, I'm not familiar with anything. It's certainly not ACR that I'm familiar with. Mary Grady may yell at me for that. But uh, I think but gold standard comes to mind is what we use is looking at it at a platform, if, if it's required. But there's a lot of groups out there that are not using registries necessarily. They're just verifying, you know, it, if it's a scope three reduction or if it's an inset and it's within your value chain, they want to show it, you know, if they're using a platform for SPTI and or, um, you know, greenhouse gas protocol or what have you, that they're verifying it within that so that they can show the reduction and reduction of, of their scope of emissions. And that's usually enough. Now, if you're trying to sell it to someone else outside, like for an offset, it's more important to have those platforms because you're you're dealing with different parties, and there needs to be a little bit more um, insurance around, you know, additionality and things of that nature. So. Yeah, to John's point, I think that's one of the challenges when it comes to talking about what is the leading standard. Um, when it comes, we don't currently participate in any offset programs. And so when you're looking at developing or you know, utilizing a standard for an inset program or scope through reductions, what we think about and talk about with our growers is you know, what is the additional cost or risk that is put onto the grower by adding a standard to this program? So when you're doing cover crops um, or hedgerows, for example, you know, how do you maintain that flexibility for the grower to still be able to do the practice and you know, farm their land how they feel it should be farmed, um, but still meet the rigor that is needed on the market? And so as of right now, I think there's a lot, there's, this is a major question mark. You know, what are the standards and how do we communicate when a grower does cover crops um, in our program, but then there's somebody in the Midwest in corn, soy, dairy doing cover crops on their field. And you know, if both of those groups are communicating to the same CPG company, and then that CPG communicates that they've helped support this many acres of cover crops, hmm. we're not currently, to my knowledge, using <laughs> any standard, and that's a problem. Um, and so within the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities program, the only standard that I really know of is the NRCS's conservation practice standards. That is what they require for their program. And I know many people benchmark against those standards as kind of as a base minimum, but those do not have any, um, I don't say relevance, but do not have any, they weren't built for this world. <laughs> and so uh, I would be you know, hard pressed to call those the leading standards. Yeah, I, I would just add to, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's the values and the claim. Right, so if you're at the end, of the, if you're looking as a buyer um, and you want to ensure that you're going to have a robust claim, um, and you you know you can do that outside of a standard or it's you know verified by an auditor against you know greenhouse gas protocol and it's very clear and they can make that claim, that's the most important thing. And I think standards are trying to come up with ways to make that more streamlined and transparent and easier. Um, but as it stands today, again, I, I think it's just important to think through. You know, when you're thinking about standards and, this, and the whole idea of this, it's at the end of the day that claim needs to be valid and it needs to be a real mitigation measure that can be, you know, part of the decarbonization journey of any any particular organization. So, great, great. So, can you guys give me an example uh, of a inset or a scope three reduction that you're working on? Kind of. What is the, the practice that's being implemented? What uh, standard or standards are you using? Um, who are, if you can disclose, who some of the customers are? Like, it, for us to get our handles around it, because at some level we've been talking about kind of this at a general level up until this point. And so can we dig back a layer or so and get some examples of kind of you know, who are the players in this? What does it look like? Um, what are some of the, the, the things that make you, ex uh, that get you excited about this area? Yeah. So in general, I would say that what, why, why use an offset versus an inset or a scope three from a kind of a, a, 
a buyer or you know buyer standpoint. And what you see a lot of is the priority in, or the you know the simple flow diagram of any type of decarbonization is quantify, reduce, and then offset. Offset in that order should come third. And if you can find ways to reduce internally, a, a lot of times that's viewed as is potentially more valuable than an offset, right? And then offsets are used for residual emissions. And so what I would say is what we're working on um, in that regard for that interest and that ask is two, is two types. We have uh, regenerative ag, which a lot of groups here are doing. Um, it's just it naturally fits with a lot of because just, you know, agriculture is tied to so many different sectors um, and looking at ways to trace that uh, so they can claim that inset or that scope three reduction. Um, and then the other one is what we call Project Horizon, who we, what we're talking, where we look at through uh, owning forest land. And as that relates to having a plot of a forest that's sequestering CO2 and being able to claim that um, against your scope of emissions direct, not as an offset after the fact. Um, and that's not to disparage offsets. They have their place, but there is just, you know, there's a different flavors and different ways to, to, meet, you know, to meet your goals, and buyers have different interests and levels. And so we do have that project and that ability to um, a lease land to where uh, it can be essentially quantified within their scope of emissions so they can claim that direct. Um, that's forthcoming. More details on that um, as we're working through it. But those are really the two places that we're, we're focused on right now. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, one of the customers that I can talk about is Premiant for us with TruTerra. So they're sourcing a lot of corn in the Midwest generally, and they want to be able to understand what some of the additional regenerative ag practices look like on that corn that's within their supply shed. And so that generally does mean your kind of basic regenerative ag practices, whether it's a reduction in tillage or the addition of cover crops or a reduced reduction in nitrogen usage. Um, all of those pieces are going into the emissions factor accounting that we're doing for that corn within their supply shed, and then we give them what those values are so that they can actually account for them in their scope three inventories. So you're giving an, an updated emissions factor essentially for their um, uh, scope three category one emission. So instead of using the standard, you're, you're doing uh, an updated one that's based on, on what the actual practices are? Right, actually using that farmer validated data to understand what happened on that actual field for that year and making sure that you can only claim it for that single year as well. Got it. Yeah. <clears throat> and so uh, can't talk about what customers we're working with, but we do have customers who are really interested in understanding what is happening on the farm. And so through our two sustainability programs, we quantify what is the total acreage and impact of those practices, and then we can help communicate that to our customers. And this is actually one of the major challenges I've talked with uh, a lot of people in the space around is um, when we communicate to customers what those impacts are or, you know, what is this um, climate data around these practices, what we're being asked from different customers is quite different because different people follow different standards. They have um, different ways in which they go about it. And it's actually one of the major challenges, at least from the farm side, is how do I streamline and standardize, you know, how I deliver this data to customers so that I don't have to do, you know, an extraordinary amount of work to make it work for customers that are in Europe, customers that are in Central and South America, um, Asia, you know, domestic markets. It's, it's different everywhere. Um, and so I think this is actually also one of the challenges that we're working through right now in terms of how do we deliver this data. Um, but one of the, you know, repeated themes about what are the types of um, practices or things that we're doing that we hear from a lot of folks do fall within that regenerative category. So we're talking, you know, cover crops, um, hedgerows, nutrient management, um, no-till, um, and, you know, things that help to generate or improve soil health is really where we're seeing a lot of the market go. Um, and that flows very nicely into just managing an almond orchard. So it works out well for us, yeah. So, so you mentioned you, you're got, you have clients around the world mm -hmm. that you're dealing. How does that propose the challenges? So if you're trying to do a quantification, you know, is the emissions factor, is, is your portion of the emissions factor same regardless of where the almonds end up? Uh, <laughs> good question. Um, so, I mean, it will, it, it will change. Transportation is going to play into that overall impact factor. Um, but largely, this is actually a question around what data is available around tree crops or perennial crops as a whole, which are largely under-researched. So there's only a few LCAs that have really been done on almonds. And so there's 
the generalized emission factor, there's like one really out there that most folks use. And so it's mostly always the same unless we're creating a customizable one with uh, a sustainability consulting group or something like that. Um, so, you know, it's typically one factor for if it's in Europe or domestically or elsewhere. Um, yeah, as of right now, so. Very helpful, thank you. All right, so um, what are the current, what are the, the upcoming challenges that you guys are wrestling with in, within the next year? Eric, you talked a little bit about it, but any other kind of things that, that you're really concerned about or, or barriers you see to scaling up? Um, you know, uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll leave it there. So yeah, again, what are some of the, the challenges and barriers that, that you've got over the next year? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, it's a great question. Um, I'm going to try to tie it back to scope three um, and in value chain. Um, but one of the biggest challenges I believe that we're, as a, as a whole, as an industry, uh, is a, a, a contribution claim model versus a compensation or mitigation measure. Um, there's, you, you know, if you've been, if you listen to, you know, the news, the carbon pulse, what have you, there's, you, you see that term quite a lot. And I, I, I don't think it's getting enough attention from the industry on what that could do to the market as far as scaling. Contribution model is essentially a philanthropy or charity model that is, it would um, limit the amount of capital invested in the space. It, um, you, you're, you know, you're, we, where you can't use an offset or an environmental attribute as a mitigation measure, rather it's just a contribution to someone else's emissions or reductions. Uh, you can just think of that being discussed by a CFO or an executive team that needs to decarbonize. They're gonna, not going to prioritize that over trying to mitigate their own emissions. And so this whole dialogue around contribution using for offsets versus compensation or mitigation is a huge challenge. And if we, if we need to, we, offsets and other environmental attributes um, in tandem with other mitigation measures need to be a viable, robust, recognizable claim for mitigation. Uh, absent that, this market will not scale. Oh. That's a great one. Um, <laughs> I, I think, Eric, you kind of talked to it earlier of some of the harmonization of data across these different asks for farmers makes a huge difference for the farmers. If you run three different models on soil biogeochem bio models, you'll get three different answers, literally. <laughs> and it can be plus or minus 100%, which is really confusing to a farmer when they're told, this is your CI score, but this is your emissions factor. It's for the same thing. It, there shouldn't be a difference if you measure the same thing. If you took a yardstick and measured it, it should still be a yard each time, but it's not. And that's partially just where some of those models are and understanding uncertainty within the models, which is fair science. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's really confusing when you're getting back to the farm level of what does this actually mean to me and you're tying it to a tangible value and outcome for their farm. And so from my perspective, I think one of the big challenges that we all have is how do we harmonize that approach to farmers so that they are doing the right thing and we are valuing their data correctly so that they continue to do the right thing and that we can learn from that data to find what things worked best because not if you've been to one farm you've been to one farm right every single one is different it's not like you can just tell everyone to go plant cover crops and they're going to be able to do that it just doesn't work you have to be able to have some personalized aspects to this to make it scale but you also need to have some harmony to make it scale. It's really hard to kind of merge that bridge between the two. And so I think you already spoke to it, but yeah. we're seeing it across all of the different aspects of ag, including dairy too, of a single dairy is not the same as another dairy. And as a hundred year old co-op of dairies, we can say that pretty firmly, that they are all a little bit different and they have very different views. They have different ROIs. What they will do to make a change is different at every single one of those farms. Yeah, those are both wonderful points. And I mean, one of the concerns or challenges that we face, you know, as a sales and marketing cooperative, our job is to find value for the almonds that our growers deliver to us. And so when we think about scope three reductions and insets, we're inevitably going to think about, you know, how do we generate value for growers? And so we've looked at, you know, what are the financial levers or mechanisms that we can pull to actually generate value for growers by doing this type of work? And there's three main levers that we access, one being um, price premiums, so we can do this work and then potentially get you know, five cents per pound for 
almonds delivered to a CPG. There are outcome payments, and so that aligns more directly with the work that most of us probably here are familiar with. So we can get a payment for some ton of CO2 equivalent um, reduced or captured uh, in our orchards. There are project-based payments or practice-based payments. So a company or customer can come to us and say, hey, we'll give you $100,000 to do cover crops, and we'll just give it to your growers. Great, super easy. Um, and then there's two non-traditional ways we look at value too. There's also an increase in volume. So we can take some of the share away from other hall handlers and just you know sell more and there's a value to that. And then the fifth one, which uh, is worrisome to us, is uh, there is maintaining volume or volume maintenance, which we've actually already seen um, from customers is basically saying, if you aren't doing this work, if you aren't reducing your scope three emissions, we will stop buying from you. And so basically what that means is that um, this type of work becomes table stakes. And we're particularly worried about this, um, this lever because that means that the financial risk probably, not probably, the financial risk falls onto us to do that, which means it falls onto growers. And I think most of us can agree that growers are already pretty, are spread pretty thin. And so the challenge really comes is where is the value for this work going to come? I don't think anybody will really disagree that this is you know, important and we need to do it. But at the end of the day, if we're looking to have to have to do this on the farm, who is going to pay for that on the farm? And if everybody kind of shirks that responsibility, it falls onto the growers. And if the grower doesn't have any financial ability to do that, the work probably won't get done. And so I think that's one of the most concerning things that we face um, or see right now. I want to pull in that thread for a minute. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we look at something. So I'm going to, because you were the last one to answer it, um, we could actually do it for, for, either, for either Karen or, or Eric. You know, when, when you look at it from um, a um, milk perspective, right, whether it is an almond milk or a, a cow milk, you, you, have, you, you, have, you, have, you have multiple steps in the chain, right? Yeah. So, so, so if you're going into Starbucks, right, and, and you're going to go ahead and, and get your, your, your latte or whatever it is there, that milk beverage that's in there ends up having been through, the, through multiple parts of the supply chain, right? There is, um, you, you take it, you take your raw material, whether it's the raw milk or you take the almonds, and you go ahead and, cr and either in the milk pr process, you end up processing it and, and pasteurizing it, or you end up taking the almonds and creating milk out of it. Well, there's someone that does that, then there's someone else that packages it, and then there's someone that transports it, and then there's someone that warehouses it. And you know, when we talk about these insetting, we're talking about this supply chain, like from the um, producer to Starbucks, there's multiple parts in that chain, and every single one of them, it's a scope three reduction. Right, the scope three emission, the scope three emission, and any changes then become a scope three reduction. So we've got Starbucks, they're driving it, but how do we get each node of that chain participating in this market? That is a fantastic question, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> not I'm not question. sure we have solved that one uh, efficiently, um, but I know that that is something that we're looking into, is how do you build collaborations along the supply chain so we're all speaking the same language and going towards the same goal? And how you do that and get the checkoff from each group is the challenge that we have faced, is when you bring all these groups together, they have just slightly different goals around these things because this work is intrinsically connected to a lot of other environmental outcomes. And so it pulls this into a couple different directions that makes it really difficult to get buy-in and financial support from each person or node along that supply chain. And I hope we solve it soon. I don't have an answer right now. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say we're also trying, right? Is that that's from a from a resiliency standpoint, for supply chain resiliency, you want every single one of those nodes to play a part in the value of that sustainability claim. Ideally, you do. It's really hard to get every single one of them to speak the same language, let alone to actually want to implement the same amount of effort or monetization at the end of the day for their section, their node. And so that has been a challenge across the industry of how do you equitably deliver that? How do you make sure that they are ta talking apples to apples and not apples to oranges? Because 80% of the time it is apples to oranges. And that makes it really hard to get someone to do something in the first place when they don't even know that they're talking about the same thing, actually. Yeah. 
I, I would just add, I mean, within our regenerative agriculture um, space, we, you know, we, I think it comes back to your, your point, like who's paying for it, right? Um, in this case, in your example, Starbucks, if they're looking to reduce their scope three emissions, they, they're probably the, the most capitalized in that scenario. Uh, and they would need to kind of be running that group with a, a good partner that can trace back all of those emissions. But it comes with, why are those groups gonna do it? And if there's a value stack on top, they will do it, um, if it makes sense to do it. But within our, pro our, our, you know, our process, we, we, you know, we pay the growers up front, so we take risk to finance that behavioral change um, at, at the, um, with the idea of the market returning a, you know, making a return for us, right? So we're putting, a new is putting financial risk in that case um, and believing on the market. And so without a market, without, you know, real mitigation measures that can be used and buyers coming to the market and growing this, that investment wouldn't occur and that reductions wouldn't occur, right? And that's the beauty of our space. Market-based systems work if you have, a, you know, an operating liquid market with a price on carbon. Um, and so if we start thinking of it as a currency and value stack across the way or va adding value on it across that chain, um, those, that, it'll change. But, it, you, you know, you have to you have, have buy-in from someone that's going to be writing the check. So, mm -hmm. so the, there has been, you know, since our last NACW, there have been a whole host of things that have happened, right? We've had the ICVCM. We've had uh, furtherance of the task force for climate-related disclosures. This is the SEC guidance that, that just came out. There's a land sector and removals guidance that has come out. Um, there's probably a whole host of them that I'm forgetting. VCMI, I think, was in the last year. Which of these is having the, the largest impact in what you're doing? Which are the ones that are, are, are changing the way you look and think about your programs the most? Uh, it's, well, I like to call it the alphabet soup. There's so many of them. Um, the, so, look, it's great. VCMI, ICVCM, um, you know, even Oxford Principles came out recently um, recognizing offsets. SEC, you know, it makes reference to it as well. All of these different groups and organizations putting a spotlight on our market, at the end of the day, is really, it's great, right? Now, we have to get it right um, and, and make sure we're instilling integrity into these systems. Um, if you're asking me what, what, if one in particular that I'm excited about, I, you know, I think the, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the VCMI on the, it's basically focused on the demand side, ICVCM is on the supply side, where you can have a buyer that really feels comfortable on a standard that can point to it and then it includes offsets as meeting a goal and a viable claim. It comes back to just being a real claim and a standard that's supporting that claim, that gets me the most excited because we, we need that. Um, you know, buyers get confused on how they can make claims and not get plastered all over the Wall Street Journal, right? Um, and if you have that protection and coalitions that are saying this is the right way to do it and it's viable, then um, I'm all for that and that's probably what I get most excited about. So. Yeah, I, I think personally for me, some of the SEC rulings and how we're actually looking at it as a financial measure is a really valuable thing for our market overall. Being able to have an auditable trail for what these claims are so that there's just more credibility there, I think is valuable for our entire market because at the end of the day, all of these claims are built from trust in the market that these are real and that it is happening. And so if we lose that, we lose the entire market and all of this good work that we are currently pushing through. So from my perspective, that even if it is a bit of a pain in the butt to do some of these things, it needs to happen to be able to actually show tangible progress towards where we're trying to go. Otherwise, you're going to keep talking apples to oranges to people and no one's going to understand what you're actually doing. And so the people who are doing the really good work aren't going to be valued for it because you won't know what's the good work versus the not so great work. Yeah, and so I'm not going to say anything too different here. I think at least the thing that gets most recognized or discussed within our work is the land sectors and removals guidance, um, so GHG protocol. Um, I think there's, for us, a lot of challenges as a company that 
we have two separate arms to our group. We have a branded division, so if you've seen almonds, you like blue diamond almonds, we have that side. Then we also have an unbranded ingredients division. And so, you know, when it comes to this type of work, it looks a little bit different depending on what area we're in. Um, and then to John's point, you know, making claims and concerns around potentially getting plastered on the Wall Street Journal or, you know, um, greenwashing, I think, especially with a lot of the new regulation that has come out of California, um, around SB 253, 261, and then AB um, 1305. Uh, there's a lot. <laughs> exactly. But point being is that there, there's a whole handful, whole list of new regulations that have come up down the pipeline that I think we are currently just sitting back and trying to look and see what we can do to continue to move forward and not um, make sure that the integrity behind our program is still there so that we don't get into running into trouble from any of these types of programs or falling out of line with any of these new rulings or guidances that have come out. So we're going to open it up here for questions in just a minute. Uh, I'm going to ask one final question and then um, we've got uh, uh, a good amount of time for you guys to, to, to uh, ask these folks uh, so for some feedback or answer some of your burning questions. Um, so my last question is, is if you could change one thing right now that would make scope three or insetting a lot easier, what would it be? What would you create? What rules would you change? What tool would you create? Like what is it, that would, like you've got, um, Ira Flato on Science Friday often says the, the, the million dollar blank check. So if, if, if I had handed you a million dollar blank check today, what would you, what would you invest it in? What would you create? What would you change? Can I start with this? Should go for it. Growers will do it if you pay them. Like farmers will do it if you pay them. But um, how much? Like what's, what's the it's right It's different number? for every practice, but we pay $35 per orchard acre for cover crops, 50 for conservation cover. We provide $900 for whole orchard recycling. And for hedgerows, it's $8 per linear foot. And so there is a price for doing practices. Growers are really good at doing things for a certain market like premium or cost. And we have discussed with them and they say, yeah, if you will pay us to do this work, we can do it. So I think my blank check would be like, if we just pay growers or find ways to funnel that value to growers, I think we'll see a lot more uptake as well as you know, potentially reducing what the grower has to do. So we give them the money, they do the work, and then we have separate groups that can come in and help verify, develop these MRV, MRV programs to actually get it to the point where they have these verifiable and rigorous claims that we would need um, for the markets that we're working in. Who wants to go next? Oh, Karen Chuck? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I love the magic wand question. I, I think it's very similar to how I think of this, Eric, of yeah. how do you create an efficient market that the right players are valuing the right things mm -hmm. very efficiently would be the magic wand of figure out how to do that so that the farmers understand what value they're going to get for doing a thing fully all the way through for the next X years, we'll say for the next 100 years if you do the things, that you'll keep getting that value, whatever it is, and that someone is always going to buy it from you. And so there's risk that's been mitigated across that entire supply chain that we just are not even close to getting there right now. Right now, if you ask a farmer what would four different carbon groups pay you, they would give you four different answers. And they would have four different opportunities there and four different risk profiles with those four different groups. And so you're still not driving the actual tangible t change that you want to see on those fields because it's too confusing, which is fair. You shouldn't expect a farmer to be able to understand all of those things and operate their farm and know an ROI on their own farm and to be able to know if uh, you know, someone downstream like a Starbucks wants to buy something that they're growing or not and if it's going to change. And for them to take on all that risk just isn't reasonable. Yeah, I'm not going to say much different other than if I had a million dollar check, I, I think that to, for these, to find the efficiencies uh, that we're, you know, we're, the panelists are talking about and to create change, behavioral change and real mitigation cost effectively, we need more awareness from the groups that are going to be writing the check, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you can <clears throat> provide more, I would say, transparency and effectiveness and really define the utility of these attributes to the groups that are going to need to decarbonize 2030, 2050, and beyond, and accelerate them um, and create a liquid market, a market of how this market should function to create real scalable change. 
um, we need that awareness, we need that buy-in. Um, and um, I think it's coming, it's just a little bit slower than everybody wants, so. Great. Well, thank you all very much. So now we've got time for questions. Who's got questions? Okay, we see one back here. So Mackenzie will come and bring you a question, and then we'll uh, bring it to Max next. Hi, Connor from HD Commodities. Question, if you have any experience or you're finding uh, interaction with auditors for reporting companies greenhouse gas inventories um, are the auditors engaging in this do they know anything about it uh, would they even know what they're looking at if one of these companies went and tried to report scope through reductions it, uh, yeah I was just talking to an auditor right before this um, the, you know <laughs> scope three is difficult right it's challenging um, the, but there are groups that are doing it Right, and they are quantifying it and verifying it. You know, ISO accredited auditors that are doing it. Um, if, if what I would say is that that work is being done, um, is it is it being done kind of on a standard or a platform? I think that's still early stages. I think there's a lot of groups thinking through, just hiring an auditor or a consultant, or maybe hiring a separate consultant and then hiring an auditor to audit the consultant to make sure to, to really trace the whole emission reductions packages. And I've seen those reports before um, and, gr and groups putting it on their sustainability reports. So yeah, and it, it's definitely happening. Um, you know, and I would say, you know, uh, auditors right now are extremely busy. The whole quantification pathway right now is, is, is crazy, right? So we, I would just add to that last question is that we need more auditors because this is, it's, it, they're extremely busy. There are some of the ag auditors out there yeah. that, that are booked out until January of next year. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've seen the same thing. Like, the really good ones who do know their stuff, they, they're really booked. They're really busy. <laughs> but they do know their stuff, 100%. Like, some of them are farmers. They used to be farmers or they own their own farms. Like, they know their stuff when they're asking questions. They know if they say, is this actually a no-till tractor? tractor? Is it strip-till? And then someone's like, yeah, it is. And they're like, no. <laughs> It's not. They would know to say that. Like, they do know some of those details. Yeah. Um, we have an internal auditor uh, on staff, so it's very helpful to talk with them. And I think it matters, or it depends upon, you know, what we're auditing. So when we talk about climate data and where we're putting that data, there's four buckets largely that we audit or look at. And so the first one being sustainability reports or customer requests. Second being, you know, it could be environmental markets, so that could be carbon offsets, insets. Um, Third being on product claims, so when we put something on our packages. And then the fourth being uh, anything climate disclosure related. That could be scope through reporting through TCFD, um, CDP, um, or it could be you know future, um, future goals like science-based targets. Um, and so that's voluntary, and then there's regulatory, um, regulatory climate disclosure. So that's you know California's new SB 253 coming down the pipeline. That's EU CSRD, um, and the whole host of new regulatory requirements. And our auditor looks at each one of those differently and has a separate process for those. Yeah. Excellent, Max. Hello, uh, Max Dubison, Indigo Ag. Um, question. Maybe mostly for John and Karen um, concerning like annual crops. So sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, how are you thinking about crop rotations and allocating that impact where maybe your client is buying one of the crops but not the other crop in the rotation? And how you think about the incentive for the farmer across the different crop rotations over time? Yeah. So I can talk to how TrueTerra works through this. Um, so. Spot on, most of the Midwest, you're growing soybeans and corn. You're not just growing corn. You're not just growing soybeans. And so we have programs that today are for soybeans, corn, wheat, and cotton. Um, those are the four crops that we can actually quantify an emissions factor on. And so on the off years, if they have pumpkins or something silly in their rotation, we just don't calculate an emissions factor for that different thing which is a little different than how offsets used to be calculated using a full like blended baseline and a counterfactual. This is really specific to the actual crop that's coming off that field, and different customers are asking for those emissions factors between soybeans versus corn. They just go to different customers. Yeah, it, it's great. So the way we think about it currently is, is blending in potential compliance markets, tying into 
um, you know, the IRA or uh, LCFS for certain crops that could qualify upstream from that, and then the rotational crop, you know, that, that, that may not qualify that goes to the voluntary market. So we, we look at ways to leverage, you know, compliance and voluntary to maximize value for any grower. Let me just take a thing and expand on that a little bit. What about kind of the different products from a crop? So, like, if you've got soybean, you've got the soybean oil, you've got uh, the, the soybean meal, you've got, you know, those are going into different markets, and you've got different buyers on them. How do you allocate the, the, the benefits or the costs across, across that? So not only are you you're doing it across crops, but you're doing it across products from a, a crop. And I don't know, Eric, if that, that applies to you as well, because you do have different parts of, uh, of the almond that go different ways, so... Yeah, I mean, I think that this is becoming more of a challenge now, um, especially with 45Z and otherwise being part of this and a lot of that value wanting to go to the soybean oil and going to renewable diesel and SAF. Right. And so then does that mean that all of the soybean meal that's coming off of that crush facility doesn't have any carbon claims? Right? Like, you, we have to be really careful that we're not double counting across all of these different carbon mechanisms and markets, but there's not there's not a standard today. There's not a way for us to say, this is how you have to do it because it's not a regulated market yet. Whether like the Greek guidance that comes out gets to that specificity, I doubt it. Maybe, that'd be great. Seems super helpful. But. Eric or John, anything to add? No. All right, other questions from the room here? Uh, we've got one over here and then in the back. And as, as the mic's going over there, I'm going to try to stop just a few minutes early since because we're going to have Governor Jay Inslee up in the ballroom. And I don't know about you, but I, I want to make sure I get in there to hear him, him speak. So go ahead. Uh, thanks. My name is Patrick Wood. <clears throat> I, uh, my company, Ag Methane Advisors, we help dairies and people in the dairy industry create a variety of credits. And going, following off the double counting comment, we've seen a interesting tension over the last sort of year where a lot of dairies that have sold their methane reduction attributes into like an LCFS program, perhaps for a long term, like 15 or 20 years, are now hearing from their co-ops that uh, they may not be as interested in buying their milk in a few years. Similar issue to what uh, Blue Diamond is seeing. And so we're seeing dairy uh, dairy farms before they get into new uh, RNG agreements, which might be more lucrative, questioning whether they should do that because they may see incentives come down through scope three or they may not. And I don't know what to tell them exactly yet. Uh, I have some hypotheses about how these things might be reconciled over time, but I guess the questions are mostly for Karen and John. Like within Land of Lakes Trutera, are how are you reconciling with this? Do you have thoughts on how these things might get reconciled over time? Um, yeah, and any thoughts? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Um, so one, if you want to talk dairy, Meredith is here from our team, who's fantastic on dairy, and she is going to be able to help you more. But I mean, at the end of the day, like double counting is double counting, so we can't do it. It's very similar market dynamic that we saw before in the soil health space. And so like you have farmers right now that aren't implementing cover crops and tillage reductions because they think 45Z is going to be super valuable in a year. It might be, but it's the very similar conversation that we're having with our growers of we want to continue to implement these practices now so that they are set in and durable for as long as physically possible. But it is possible that that market will change and it will continue to increase. And most of the programs that are out there today, whether it's like True Terra or Indigo or otherwise, we continue to raise those carbon values so that we're trying to get as much back to the farmers as possible. But it gets really hard to actually negotiate that with a farmer on what do I do now? And do I take on that risk of what if it changes? What if it doesn't? It's a hard conversation that we don't really have an easy solution for, sadly. Yeah, it's um, one I want to kind of claims, double claims, double counting is, I think, is going to become a much higher risk as we go forward because much more groups are going to be wanting to make decarbonization, set sustainability goals, and there's going to be crossover. I think we're going to see this in the CCS space. Um, and we just need to be really careful. All right, we can, as a market, we can't afford to have that happen, you know, 
pervasively through our market. To your question on LCFS versus say a voluntary, I encourage you to reach out to some really um, uh, expert lawyers that have uh, thought through that, the LCFS claim and how that's claimed within that program versus the actual reduction claimed on voluntary. Um, I could share their view, but I think it's it, it can be it can be kind of controversial. So I don't I, don't, I haven't really aligned with one way or the other. But there's certainly some views out there that groups are justifying an LCFS claim and another claim. You just got to be really careful. And I can tell you from experience, we've had ARB and CAR reach out to us not on on dairy but landfill, where we had to deduct volume because LCFS overlapped. So there is that risk. You just get to watch it. So, yeah. Eric, anything to add? Okay. Nothing, nothing no worries. There. All right. In the back. Hey, everyone. My name's Leaf. I'm with Working Trees. Um, that sounds really loud. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak a bit on permanence mm -hmm. in supply chain carbon removals. That's it. <laughs> I'm, and you know what? I'm going to complicate his, his, his question a little For bit. Sure. And, and we'll try to do it in five minutes. But so let's talk permanence, and then talk about 45Z and permanence, if you can, if, if, if you've thought about it. Because here's, here's a, you've got a tax credit, which is for a limited period of time. And then what do you do about permanence if you get that tax credit? So I'll let you talk permanence generally, and then tell me about what you think about 45Z and permanence. Well, I think trees should answer permanence first. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot easier. <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> So I am not, I am not the, the one to talk about 45Z on our team, so I can't really speak to that, All Robert. Right. So that thank you for <laughs> complicating that question. Um, but the permanence <laughs> topic is something we talk about quite a bit in almonds because our typical lifespan is 25 years. Um, and with the price of almonds lately, growers have been removing trees at as early as potentially 15 years. And so concerns around, you know, creating credits or, um, well, creating... Um, climate data that we then supply to groups who then claim that is a challenge for us currently. And what we try to do our best is communicate that there is an average lifespan of 25 years and that you know we're implementing these practices across X amount of acres. We've measured this impact and the risk we're kind of trying to say like is on that group if they want to make a claim around that because we don't have a, we don't have an answer around this until the, all of the guidance has come down around GHG protocol and any standards might come through. Um, I don't have a great answer for that. It's one of the things that we talk about quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, and then on the 45Z side, so the 45Z under the IRA is the renewable fuels tax credit that's going to come in wow. online in 2025. Um, the current way that GREET calculates soil carbon um, overall is just a lookup table. It's called C-Club. Argon National Labs developed it. Um, it's a useful lookup table, but it's a lookup table that's been amortized over 20 years. There's a lot of pieces that make that very non-dynamic. So we know, as many of us have been working in these soil carbon systems, that there are a lot of dynamics from a bio side, from a geochemical side, from a weather side, that do change the carbon values for those fields and what they are, especially over time. And so there is a lot of curiosity of how 45Z will deal with that when they don't have that kind of large biogeochem model built into the regulation itself. But there's still, that guidance isn't released, so we don't know at all how they're going to try to handle that. Um, and it's a very new thing for the Treasury to try to handle that. They've never touched anything like that. So you're asking someone to do something that they've really never done, and they do know that it's a hard thing to ask to do. So, yeah, there's not like an easy answer there. We know soil carbon systems do have risk of permanence and we need to be able to have durability periods for all of our carbon programs. You should be able to ask that of any carbon program. Ours is easily 30 years. What's hard for some of these um, pieces is when we get to register credits for soil carbon specifically, a hundred year permanence is a really hard thing for a farmer to understand and to actually have a, a tangible feel for what a hundred years looks like on their farm. And as a hundred year old farmer owned co-op, that's been a really um, fun thing to discuss at the office of what does that actually look like? Does that mean that they're gonna put something on their balance sheet for a hundred years? Cause they've had a balance sheet for a hundred years. That's a really hard thing for a company that's 
that well developed to understand some of the, the newer companies don't, don't have the same risk profile, so they can handle it very differently. Yeah, I, I'll just add, I mean, Regent Ag is, yeah, it, it, the permanent side for Regent Ag is, is, it can be challenging. The way the registries do look at it, and there's some people in this room that can speak more specifically to the protocols around this, but the, it's, if you think about it as an aggregation model, and you're adding acres and you're getting at scale and something reverses, then it can be essentially uh, docked against the next issuance, right? So net-net, you're still not issuing credits that uh, may have been reversed. So if you have enough scale, enough size, you can make up for it in a future issuance. And as long as you're continuing to add and have that scale net-net, you should have the permanence. And in addition to that, these protocols are very conservative. So when they're issued credits, it's, you know, it, it, they, they, try, they very much lean on, and conservative, you know, on the conservative side. So net-net, as far as the climate's concerned, um, we're, we're trying to keep that number, um, you, know, you know, negative, basically. It's so. mm. a great question. Yeah. Great. Well, I hope you'll join me in um, thanking our panelists today for a great conversation. And then as people, so just so you know, the, the Governor Jay Inslee is going to be speaking in Grand B um, at 4.05. <laughs>